I wanted to introduce everyone that came uh, to Alexis Martin Vig. Uh, she is a wonderful trainer up near Sacramento. Um, and you're here to talk to us about rider biomechanics um, from your background Correct. working with Mary Wanless for so many years. I won't date you, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, so, yep, that go ahead and correct. introduce yourself further if you'd like, and then go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, you guys read the bio. I don't really have much more to say about that. Um, I have been doing Mary's work for close to 10 years now. And then of course, made it my own and incorporated it into what I do and, and done other research and other followings of different people who are into the human body. <laughs> Because I think it, if you don't have a good working knowledge of your own body, then it's a lot to try to ask and interface with the horse to, um, to get them to do anything with theirs. So, um, so that being said, what like that kind of dovetails into, I think like the one, sometimes especially in dressage, people have this idea of like, well, why does it matter if my position is really good, right? Isn't that for like hunters or equitation or something like that? And um, there's kind of two big reasons why you should have a strong position or a correct position. One of them is to match the forces that the horse puts upon you. Um, and then the other one is to create stability that allows you to give smaller, clearer aids. If your body has a lot of movement or misalignment, then when you try to put your aids on, they're gonna be difficult for the horse to discern between your disorganization and your aids. So I think it's really important that our position is solidified in such a way that any kind of movement or shift that we make, the horse can be sure that it's an aid and they're not confused as to whether you're just bobbling around up there or you're asking them to do something. So it's not fair of us to ask them to do something if we can't be still enough for them to tell the difference between aids and extraneous movement. So um, before I kind of go into what I consider the three main components of like what comprises the rider's position, I'm gonna just read this little, um, this is like a USEF definition from the judge's manual about what, what the correct position entails. Um, especially because I'm sure mo a lot of people show and compete and it's important to them to understand like how that affects their potential score, not just in the collectives, but in the body of the test. Okay, so USEF says posture and alignment, the rider's ear, shoulder, hip, and heel should be vertically aligned at all gates while sitting. The rider does not lean ahead of or behind the vertical. The rider is slightly in front of the vertical when posting the trot. The rider's spine is aligned with the horse's spine and the back is neither round nor hollow. The shoulders and hips are level. Stability. As a result of having a stable core, the rider sits securely in the saddle. The rider does not rock from side to side as is sometimes seen in the walk and extended trot. Elasticity. The rider has a positive mobile tension without being rigid. Weight placement. The rider sits vertically with the weight distributed equally on both seat bones whenever the horse's body is straight and doesn't slip to the outside when riding a circle, a lateral movement or any movement in which the horse is bent. The rider's body does not lean inward or outward. Following mechanics. The rider demonstrates the ability to ride in harmony with the mechanics of each gait, including the medium and extended paces. The hands act independently to maintain a steady elastic connection with the horse's mouth. So I think there actually is a really comprehensive bit of information here, but um, I think you'll see when I show some of these pictures that I've collected, as well as some of the examples that um, me and my former working student made <laughs> on video, that you don't see all of these things happening in practice. Um, <clears throat> so the components that, that I think are the important points that make up the, the rider's position attaining those goals is number one is your alignment. And that has to do with both your vertical alignment, which means viewed in profile and your lateral alignment, which is viewed from the back. And I'm gonna go into greater detail with each of these areas, but this is just a basic overview. Um, the second area is tone or tensegrity. Um, sometimes I will use those words interchangeably. 
And if you don't know what tensegrity is, the like engineering definition of it is that it's a marriage of the words tension and integrity. And it's a set of compression elements that is opposed and balanced by continuous tensile force, thereby creating stability in an, in, with an internal pressure that stabilizes the entire structure. And so those of you who are familiar with Mary's work have heard the term bear down. And I'm gonna go into that further, but tonal quality and tensegrity are super important. And in my mind, like alignment is kind of wasted if you cannot make tone and tensegrity to your body. Okay, and then the last area that composes the position as, as I see it is the following mechanics. So having good alignment and having good tone are really important, but riding a horse is, a, is an activity. <laughs> it's done in motion. So we have to have um, mechanisms for moving our body within that alignment that help us to coordinate with the horse's movement. Otherwise, we're just gonna look stiff or rigid um, or actually like lose our alignment because we're not using dynamic movement to stay in place as if we are still. Um, okay. So I'm going to go into greater detail in each of those areas. And what I might do is if everybody goes up on the little chat thing, the very first thing that I sent is a, a video link on there. And, and if you all have that ready to look at, then we can look at that video together in just a minute after I kind of go through the basic components of alignment. So, <clears throat> the first part of, of a really good position has to do with the organization of your pelvis because everything um, above your, your pelvis um, is going to be based on whether your seat bones and your pelvic cage are in neutral and everything below it is somewhat affected by it as well. It's really difficult to have a solid leg position if your pelvis is in a good neutral position. So when we talk about being in a pelvic neutral, so this is your pelvis. It's actually a female pelvis. <laughs> you can buy a female pelvis or a male pelvis. This is a female pelvis. So when we're talking about our um, vertical alignment, we'd be looking at things in the side view. And it's hard to see because the leg is in the way here. This is your femur. So your seat bones are, are here and your hip socket uh, on a woman actually is usually quite a bit forward and out to the side of where your seat bone is. And, and uh, a male pelvis, they tend to be a little bit more in line, which sometimes makes it much easier for men to sit in a really good seat bones down alignment because their leg is in line with their seat bone more than ours is. So in any case, we want our seat bones to be pointed straight down on, on the saddle surface. And if your saddle sit, fits you well, it will be relatively easy to do this and to feel your seat bones. Um, but this is an exploration you can do sitting on a saddle on a stand, sitting on a chair, is to put your hands under your butt and feel for where your seat bones are. And you can use um, contrast to be able to identify whether they are pointed down or not. Because sometimes when you look at somebody's body externally, it can, can be a little bit misleading about the position of their seat bones because of the contour of their flesh or seams on clothing can make it appear as if they are not down when they might indeed be. So the only way to know is for somebody to be really aware of where their seat bones are via the pressure through their own skin or by sitting on them. <laughs> if you can't feel them yet, um, just by sitting, uh, putting your hand under there can really help. So the way I teach people to identify whether the seat bones are pointed down is to do some slow rotating of their pelvis, which would mean you go trying to tilt your pubic bone down. And when you do this, your back, your low back will hollow and your seat bones will point to the rear. And if you were sitting on your hands, they would disappear off the back of your hands. And then alternately, you could go round your lower back, try to put your tailbone underneath of your tailbone and your seat bones would come too far forward and disappear this way off your hands. So rockering back and forth can give you information about whether they're pointed down. <clears throat> and 
then like it says in the USCF guideline, your, your, your seat should be pointed straight down. <laughs> your seat bone should be pointed straight down like all the time. There's no, there's no moment in the horse's stride in any of the gates where this isn't true. <clears throat> okay, so once we've got our seat bones down and hopefully evenly weighted, but that has to do more with lateral alignment rather than with vertical alignment. Uh, once we've got our seat bones pointed straight down, then, then it's possible to evaluate whether our back is in neutral spine. Um, if you guys are on my screen share, right, we're looking at this picture of me on the chestnut. And <clears throat> this is a pretty good example, nobody's perfect, of a neutral spine alignment, which means that it doesn't mean that my back doesn't have curves to it. It just means that the curves of the back are balanced to equal a zero in a verticality. So when you look at, at, at this photo, you can see that my ear is over my shoulder. And if I wasn't wearing the tailcoat, I think it would be um, reasonable to assume that my shoulder is over the joint of my hip. And let's see here. I think I have, let me find this other example, not that one. Sorry, guys. So we're, gonna, we're looking at this other picture now, and this is also a, a vertical alignment question. And here you can see that the shoulder is quite a bit behind the hip joint. And, and this, this photo really shows a, a spine that is not neutral because there's a pretty significant hollow in the low back, which doesn't match the pretty straight shape of the front of the rider. So the curves of the rider's spine aren't in balance. Um, and I don't think I have a picture of a round-backed rider, but it is in the, um, in the video demo. So, so when we look at the video, you'll be able to see that. So the important part about neutral spine is that the curves are in balance and that the plumb line is vertical, not so much that, um, that, that you are, are straight in your back, uh, if that makes sense. Because sense. everybody's personal conformation is different and people are naturally curvier or straighter. Um, I'm fairly straight by build. And so like in, in this picture, it's really easy to see that my low back is pretty flat, but some people will have more curve in their low back without being hollow because they just have a curvier spine. Uh, the, the way that you can really test for neutral is to put somebody, if you're a teacher and you're comfortable with kind of manhandling your students around a little bit and they consent to it, you can put somebody sitting um, on a mounting block or a stool and in such a way that you can get above them and put your hands on their shoulders. And if they think they're in neutral and you bear weight down onto their shoulders, it won't compress them or make them rock forward or back. It'll just absorb the force and, and not deform the shape of their body in any way. If they are hollow or round backed um, or leaning forward or back, when you put your weight down on them like this, it will have an effect. And so that is a way you can test somebody's ability to be in neutral as long as they um, consent to it and don't have any injuries or anything that you might aggravate by that if you're not sure if you're putting them in a good position or not. <clears throat> okay, um, so that's neutral spine in your pelvis. Um, your legs, like I said before, if you are in a good seat bones down position, it makes it much easier to have your leg organized underneath of you because that stability generated allows you to have a leg that what kind of some people say is the ideal that it looks like it's draping over the horse. <clears throat> So we can look again at this picture of me on the chestnut and the important feature of being able to align your legs so that your heel is in line with your hip joint is that your stirrups are the appropriate length. So we can go back to, um, where is the, um, this one is not the worst example of, of the stirrups being too long and shoving the legs forward, uh, but, but you can see that she has a much more open angle between her, um, of her knee. But I believe actually that the stirrups are probably an okay length because if she were to put her 
foot back so that the heel is under the hip joint, there would be a bend in her knee that would support her upper body much more stable, in my, in my opinion. <clears throat> so um, when you look at the rider's stirrup length, <clears throat> you can use um, a horizontal line to assess whether you think that the stirrup is the correct length by doing an imaginary horizontal line across from their knee joint and the angle above that line, like between the horizontal line and their thigh bone should be somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees. Um, more experienced riders, uh, upper level riders, they can get away with a more open angle there because they have more core strength usually to support their upper body with a longer stirrup. A more novice rider is gonna find it much easier to have more of that 45 degree angle between the horizontal line and the knee joint to give them the stability um, to be able to not be too heavy in their stirrup, as well as to make the correct mechanism in the rising trot. Um, the, so as far as below the knee, um, the placement of your stirrup iron should be on the ball of your foot um, for a couple of reasons. I think it is really easy to overflex the ankle on many people and the longer you make the lever arm, like by putting the stirrup on your toe, the easier it is to make the wrong kind of leverage that closes the joint of the ankle. So um, you want to actually make that fulcrum shorter so that you're not in in inclined to hyperflex your ankle. <clears throat> um, and I'll get more into like why it's important not to have your ankle overflexed or any of your joints maxed out, um, but for now, we're just gonna go with the stirrup should be on the ball of the foot so that you don't put your heels down too much <laughs> and your stirrup can rest on your foot rather than like press down. And I think this photo is actually a really great example of that in terms of the fact that this is in an extended trot where um, it's often really tempting to put all of your weight in your stirrups and to over flex the ankle. Um, and in this picture, you can see that my foot is on the level and the stirrup is on the ball of the foot and it's enabling me um, to which I will talk about later, to match the forces of the horse with my hip joint rather than using um, overflexion of the ankle joint, which you see a lot in sitting trot. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not gonna talk really terribly much about the arm alignment when you're looking in the, the vertical plane because the more important feature of the arms is the following mechanics. But I think everyone is familiar with the kind of general rule that we hope that there's a relatively straight line between the bit and your elbow. And having, um, having that line enables you to have clearer following mechanics and not be distorting the weight in the rein by breaking it either like above or too low kind of affects how your elbow joint works. And then the other important thing about arms is really clearly having the wrist in line with the forearm um, rather than broken in or broken out or like twisted in some way. Because all of those things, um, as I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, affect your ability to have the, your, your joints be in mid range. You don't want anything to be maxed out. So hyperflexing it this way, or that way, or putting like a, a rotational element in how you use your hand. Um, it is it is just kind of adding a kink in the system that is gonna affect your tone and tensegrity and your following mechanics. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and then we talked about vertical alignment. So lateral alignment means the view from the front or the back. Um, most of the time we say from the back just because it's harder to see people's alignment from the front with the horse in the way. Um, that being said, I actually did find two really good pictures that kind of demonstrate the lateral alignment in, in the lateral work and, and how it can go wrong or how it could be right. So in this picture, somebody did the privilege of putting a vertical line in it, which is really nice because it shows you how the rider is not aligned laterally with where vertical is. And really this, this horse is maybe a little bit leany under the rider because the rider isn't sitting in the direction of the half pass and their, their body isn't 
aligned 50% on the left, 50% on the right. And so then, which we can compare it to this lovely young rider that I found. I think she looks like a young rider, uh, where she is, if we drew a line, she is really quite centered, not only to the vertical, but over the center of the horse. And the horse is in much better balance as a result of her being laterally aligned, that half of her is on the left of the horse, half of her is on the right of the horse, her feet look level. And so I'm gonna assume probably that her hip joints are level and that the horse's back is level. Whereas when we can go back and look at this one, we can see that it, it looks like she may have been able to retain her feet being nearly level despite the angle here in her, um, her right hip is hidden by the horse's neck, but it looks quite a bit higher than the left hip as does the, the horse's back, right? The horse's back doesn't look level. So who's the chicken and who's the egg? I don't know, because obviously it's just a snapshot. It's a moment in time. It may have been better one half a stride later or something, but um, we, we should strive to have half of our body on, on each half of the horse's body. And we achieve that through primarily the, the first place that we're going to achieve that is through even weighting of our seat bones. And if you have a really hard time locating one of your seat bones, uh, and this is something you can explore by sitting on your hands, then spending a good amount of time in that position to explore like what the weight on each seat bone is without the horse involved, either sitting on a saddle on a stand or sitting in a hard chair and experimenting with how you might be able to level out that pressure by lifting a knee or pressing a foot into the floor harder can help you to establish like which seat bone wants to bear more weight or maybe one doesn't bear any weight at all and is completely absent because um, that happens and we can ride merrily along for years with all of our weight on one seat bone <laughs> and, and be oblivious to it like I did for a long time. So uh, it's, totally, it's totally a thing, know where your seat bones are. So if you have weight 50-50 on your seat bones, then you are already at a much greater chance of having a decent lateral alignment, but um, the weight bearing is one part of it, and then the weight, and then the placement. <laughs> oh, I'm reading Megan's chat. Um, so, where your seat bone placement is the other factor. So you could have seat bones that are evenly weighted, but are off to one side of the saddle. So we have our pelvis again, and maybe. They're really evenly weighted, but if my face underneath this pelvis was the middle of the saddle, they could be off to one side. And while they're evenly weighted, uh, they're not in the center of the horse. And so being able to evaluate that is a really great, um, a great tool. And one of the ways that you can, can do it again is on a saddle on a stand. Um, and you also can use contrasting feelings to help you feel for that or you can do it on your horse with contrasting feelings by going up like you're going into a rising trot and then putting your butt down where you go i'm clearly going to put my whatever seat bone in the center of the saddle and feel what it feels like when the other one is off the slope of the saddle <laughs> jen says her, her her left seat bone is missing yeah <laughs> it happens um, and then you can do the same thing with the other side get up out of the tack like you're gonna go up in rising trot and then put yourself back down slowly with the other seat bone in the center of the saddle and the other one um, off the slope of the saddle. And you might find that one of those positions feels really comfortable to you, which is a good indicator that that's where you sit most of the time. Uh, okay, so that's the pelvic part of lateral alignment. When your torso is in lateral alignment, it's pretty easy to diagnose looking at somebody from the front of the back, like this half pass picture. Um, a couple of ways that it can go wrong, we'll look at in the video. And that involves doing C curving, which is just like it sounds. If we looked at someone from the back, they would look like a, a C shape one way or the other. Um, and C curves can often be associated too with a rotational element where the torso is, is twisting as well as doing a C curve of the spine. And some, sometimes those things are really subtle and they're not as, as easy to see as we might think. You go, oh, I would know if I sat like rotating or C-curving, but they can be really small degrees 
uh, and, and you don't notice them until you start chipping away at the layers of the issues that you might have, the bigger pieces of, of stuff that you might have with your position go away. Those are the things that I find remain. And we all are probably going to struggle with, uh, I think, particularly a rotational element to a lateral asymmetry where we ride with like one shoulder ever so slightly advanced. This is an exaggeration, um, but it has an effect, a knock on effect of drawing the opposite seat bone backwards. And then the opposite would be true on the other side. And those kind of things can be really subtle. We can be talking about like a centimeter. So most people wouldn't see it when they watch you ride, but the horse can feel it. So, so just having that in mind when you, um, yeah, so that's what, so having your, I tend to not use the word hip because usually it's the seat bone that's really involved um, to, to cause that to happen. Because if you're bringing your hip back, it, it's, it's really, chances are your seat bone is also further back in the saddle and you can kind of address both of those at the same time. And, and it would be unusual for it to not have an effect in the upper body as well. Sometimes the visible part is what somebody's doing in their upper body. And actually the more important part is what's happening in the pelvis, but you can diagnose it by seeing what's happening up top. Um, a more advanced rider might have a pelvic floor thing where one seat bone is forward or back and you don't see it in their torso because they've gotten to, um, uh, they, they've gotten to the point where they have unwoven the problem very, very deeply, except for that piece in the pelvis. And um, something that's interesting just to go back to like pelvic anatomy here, is it is it is really possible that you have a, a bony asymmetry that you have to work through with um, body work, manual therapy, stretching, because of of injury or just your confirmation, where you could have like if we're looking at it from the bottom, like you could have a twisting kind of thing where one seat bone is pulled more forward or back because the attachment at the pubic bone and the attachment of your sacrum is cartilage. So it's possible for those areas to move and be changed over time or um, be, be changed like kind of in, in a very short amount of time because they are flexible. So if you've had an injury or um, you just think that you have a, a twist built up from, from time and habit, it is possible that you have a, a bony disparity going with it that you can work through and change. <clears throat> um, and yeah, and I, I don't think there's anybody who's built symmetrically. <laughs> Everybody, you know, horses either, they're all, every, we're all crooked. It's just how much we mitigate it and continue to try to like work through it to be as laterally symmetrical as we can for our own benefit and for the, for the horses. Okay. So I think that's probably as much as I'm going to say generally about the two alignment components. And, um, and then we'll see some examples of it in the video to just kind of help like hone everybody's eye for what that looks like in motion. So the tone um, tensegrity thing, I think is a harder thing for uh, people to find as well as to train your eye to see when, when, it's, when it's really present um, if you haven't been looking for it before. Uh, so if we go back, let me go back to this. Uh, da -da. This picture is really interesting to me because it, uh, while she is not in a good alignment, this rider it happens to be Anki, but um, this, <laughs> this rider has a lot of tensegrity and positive tone. And so that just means that she's using her internal pressures and um, the opposing structures of her musculature to generate force like power and as well as stability because even though I don't think that she's very al aligned here she actually looks kind of stable and strong in it. Mary would say that a, a, a rider who has the right amount of tone looks well stuffed like if they were a stuffed animal that they would have brand new stuffing from the factory <laughs> and be full of, like free of wrinkles and and divots or or like lumpy parts <laughs> so that's another way of of looking at it and tone is best evaluated in motion because while i think i i can make a generalization about the tone of this photo 
usually it's much better to, to evaluate it in motion. And the um, people who have, uh, I just like lost my place in my notes there. Um, people who have really low tone are, are gonna struggle a lot with learning to stay organized while riding well, just because the forces of the horse are gonna cause movement in their entire body that makes it difficult for them to maintain their alignment. So the tone and alignment are really intertwined with each other because you cannot maintain the correct alignment without enough tone to support your body staying there while the horse is in motion. So it's, it's, I think it's really important that when you're, when you're teaching riders or when you're teaching yourself that you understand that the, the, the more the horse moves, then the more tone or tensegrity you need to maintain your alignment. So as a, as a coach, the coaches out there, it's not good enough to tell people where they should be when they sit if you're, if you're not going to teach them how to generate the strength to maintain that position in motion. And I think that for me is like the piece that is missing um, or at least was missing from my riding education for like all of my young life If nobody ever taught me like it's not good enough to sit this way how do you stay sitting this way when the horse is going <laughs> it's great in a, in a when the horse is standing still to look like you're in this beautiful vertical lateral alignment but what do you do when the horse is going so there's a couple of tools that help people to get tone and the primary thing um, that riders have to learn how to do, which is in, it's in, in the USEF definition, just kind of as a empty verbiage, it says, as a result of having a stable core, the rider sits securely in the saddle. You're like, that's all well and good. How do I do that? So, so Mary Wanless calls this bearing down, uh, but she says admittedly that probably a better term for it would have been bearing out. And, and what it means is that it, the long explanation is, is you firm up your exterior, like if your skin was a boundary, and you push your insides against that boundary. And bearing down primarily refers to your abdominal and postural muscles. Um, so not just the, your you know, abs, but also your, your intercostals and lats, as well as your long back muscles. And when you're bearing down well, it's as if somebody could punch you or shove you and you would retain your, your balance on top of your feet, if that was the case, because you're, you're ready for impact, as it were. And you can use that same force, that same idea of opposing muscle groups pushing on each other for stability to make stability in your legs and arms also but it usually takes longer to develop that feeling of having the right amount of, of tone of structural like resistance in your arms and legs without looking or feeling rigid. Um, the other way I'm gonna grab out of my box here, the way that I help people to develop tone um, in their arms and legs once they know how to bear down and can do that reasonably well um, if they are a low tone rider and they have trouble controlling the movement of their arms and legs to generate stability, uh, you can, and they have better ones out there now. I can't remember what the, maybe, maybe Megan remembers, um, at the Mary Clinic, like there's some company making those bands, um, that go like across the whole body, I think specifically for riders. I don't remember, but maybe Megan does. So these are just like bands that you could buy on Amazon for moving furniture. And they're, they're stretchy, but they're not like crazy stretchy. And if you're, if you're a coach or even if you want to do unmounted exercises by yourself uh, and you, you probably need a helper to do them on the ground or with the horse, you can use these to make a resistance that the body has to push against and to generate the feeling of making tensegrity. <laughs> I, I can't remember what the name of the company was. And there are, there's a company that's making ones that are big enough that you can put them across your body diagonally, like from a shoulder down to the foot in the stirrup um, to make a resistance to push against while you're riding. And if you have the right horse for it, you could totally do this. And uh, Megan and I saw it in real time. And it, it really does help people to figure out how to make the right kind of springy elastic tensegrity to their limbs particularly. Um, the way that I will use this on 
riders is sometimes I will loop it like over their knee. So if my elbow was their knee joint, I will loop it over their knee and then put the other end over the foot and they have to resist in both directions. <clears throat> oh, cool, performance bands, there you go. And, and that gives people the feeling of how to have tone in their lower leg to help prevent the kind of wobbling and um, swinging that, that you often see. Um, okay, so yeah, resistance bands. So, um, oh, I should have said this earlier. So tone and tensegrity, uh, a way that it can be helpful to differentiate in your mind um, how the parts of your body work together to create it is that um, when you're talking about matching the forces of the horse in order to be in unison with their movements, you use your muscles to make stability. So your, your muscles are, are the motor, they're doing the work, okay? And your joints are there to make mobility. So, so that like the muscles are like the, the power, they, they're creating the engine, but the joints are the pistons. They are actually doing the motion part. And when you see people that, uh, um, and you often see riders that, that do that the other way around, <laughs> they try to use their joints for power, either via kicking or um, like too much like humping of the saddle to make something happen. That's use, trying to use your joints for power rather than trying to use your muscles for the power and stability and the joints do the moving part, which means that you're like a really good example is, is that your bear down creates a strength that enables your spine to be held in a vertical position. And then your hip joint is what does the mobilization for sitting the trot rather than your, your, um, your spine being moved all around in the front back plane like this, which you sometimes see when people sit the trot, that they do like a whiplash. And that's because their muscles haven't stabilized this structure to make it so that the hip joint does the moving and the spine stays still and just goes up and down. And that's also important when it comes to the joints of the rest of your leg. And in order for your joints to be able to work, to be the mobility that you need them to be, they can't be in a completely extended or a completely flexed position. So if you think of a spring or a hinge, like I think a hinge is a better example because it's much more like a joint. So if a hinge is, is totally closed, I can't close it anymore. The only thing I can do is open it. All right, so I only have one option for the type of movement I can make. If the hinge is totally open, I can't open it anymore. The only thing I can do is close it. And so now again, I only have one option for the type of movement I'm gonna make. So if my hinge is in a neutral position where it's neither hyper extended or hyper contracted, now it has the ability to move to absorb motion. And that's what your hip joint does. And then secondary, it's what your knee joint does. And then tertiary, it's what your ankle joint will do. So if, if my wrist was my ankle, if I don't have my foot level, instead I have my ankle locked all the way down, it, it no longer can absorb any motion in that direction. If I have all my weight on my stirrup and the ankle locked down, the only thing it can possibly do is send that force up the leg and then up the body and, and bouncing out of the saddle, right? Or it, it, sometimes people have this magical way of, of getting their butt glued to the saddle but then the ankle joint does this dance maneuver <laughs> that, that, but it's somewhat of the same, the same issue, but more related to the lack of tone and tensegrity. So they're, they're not trying to stabilize and achieve a neutral position that allows for mobility of the joint in both directions without maxing it out. And, you know, riding isn't really a hyper flexible person's sport. It's, it's kind of a mid range, athletic ability. I'm sorry if everyone wants to say that they're working really hard because we are working hard, but, but there's, there's no comparison to the amount of range that our joints need to go through in something um, like running or gymnastics, which 
you have to have this availability to just go on both ends of the spectrum really straight, really extreme. Riding is not that. So achieving a good neutral position for our joints is not impossible. It's, it's very doable and, and very necessary. <clears throat> okay, so then the, the last component to um, what I think is <clears throat> a really stable or creating the correct position is the following mechanics. And following mechanics for me, a lot of people just talk about it in terms of the arms, but it's both your arms and your hip joint. And yes, your knees and your ankles are a part of what happens in your leg, you know, in your legs to absorb the motion of the horse, but I'm just gonna focus on the hip joint and um, the elbow joint because in your arms, the elbow is doing most of the work in the following, a, a little bit the shoulder, but primarily your elbow joint. So when you're, we're talking about the walk, because um, I'm just going to go through each of the gates really quickly, uh, I like to think of how the horse's back moves for this to make sense of like why you should move your body a certain way. So in the walk, the horse's back, we're going to take out, you know, the fact that the, the belly of the horse pendulums from side to side, because as it says in the USCF definition that you don't want to see the rider swinging from side to side ever. So we're just going to talk about the fact that the back moves horizontally, like front, back, front, back, front, back. And horses with the bigger walk are going to have like more scope and stuff, but the general layout is a front back movement, a horizontal movement. So that means that our hip joint has to, to close in that plane as well in order to follow the back. So the hip joint is going to, let me put my seat bones more down here. So the hip joint is going to close in this horizontal plane that keeps the seat bones relatively level and the thigh bone rotates in the hip joint. And sometimes we don't really think about how that actually happens, right? Like that our, that we have this socket and the, the thigh bone rotates inside the, the socket. So that's how your pelvis will move backwards in the, in the walk stride on a horizontal plane. I know I'm not keeping it perfectly horizontal, but it's heavy. <clears throat> okay, and then in the walk, our elbow joint, um, does a motion that is like, I think the best way of thinking about it is like sawing wood. So both of your hands are sawing wood, this direction, horizontal plane, and they go in the opposite timing of the hip joint, right? So when your hip joint is closing and your seat bones are dragging backwards across the saddle, then your elbow joint is going opening. And then when the hip joint is opening and your seat bones are going forward, then the elbow joint is going backwards. And a lot of people struggle with that, with that timing. <clears throat> I like that, John. <laughs> yeah, don't watch, don't watch movies where people ride horses because it's always bad. <laughs> okay, so then in the trot, the horse is back and we're gonna take out the side to side thing, the diagonal balance of the gait. We're ignoring all of that because the primary motion of the horse's back in the trot is vertical, right? It's up and down. So, so that means that our hip joint has to do a little bit of a, a different mechanism in, it's the same mechanism as it would do if we were rising the trot, that it starts, use the front leg, it starts in a closed position, and then it opens and the pelvis moves up, and then it closes like this and the pelvis moves down. I know this is an exaggeration of how the thigh bone would move, that's too much, but it just gives you a, a really clear idea of how different that is from the walk motion, right? And then in the, the, the trot, this is really easy, of that the elbow joint is gonna always do the same type of motion that the hip joint does. So that means that in the trot, in order for your hands to be really appearing as if they're still in your following mechanics, then you're, I'm gonna stand up because this will be better. So then your elbow joint is gonna move in this plane, in the up-down plane in the trot so that when the when when the body goes down the elbow joint bends and when the body goes up the elbow joint opens so your hip joint and your elbow joint do the same motion whereas the walk right we, we determined that they did the opposite motion together apart open and closing opposite each other so the canter is also a horizontally moving back. It's really more like a diagonally moving back, unless your horse is a super downhill canter, <laughs> and then it might be diagonal to the front. 
um, which we hope not. Um, so the, the mechanism of the hip joint is really similar to the walk. It happens faster, but because there is a diagonal element, if the horse is uphill or is collected or just naturally has more volume to the canter, it's gonna go back front and there's a little upness to it. And then the elbow joint is, is the canter is easier in that the elbow joint is gonna still move like sawing wood, like we decided it should if it's a horizontal movement we're talking about, but it gets to go in the same timing as the hip joint rather than opposite like the walk. So you have a little easier task if you're not trying to do pat your head, rub your stomach because they're gonna go together, hip joint and elbow joint. Permitted that you can get your hip joint to move because sometimes what happens in the canter is that um, people try to do a pelvis that's like a trot where it just goes up down or they try not to use their, their hip joint um, to move their pelvis and then instead they use their upper body like a lever, which I have a really great picture of. Let's see, I think it's this one. Nope, nope, there we go. Okay, so in this, the top two photos here is the, the correct alignment of, of your upper body in the canter based on the different beats of the canter. So actually, if you look at the top right photo, that's beat one of the canter, and your upper body should be slightly inclined with your, with your seat bones pointed ever so slightly to the back of the saddle, which is if you compare it to the lower photo, the photo beneath it, this is what your body would look like if it was in vertical on the beat one of the canter, which might, you might look at that and go, okay, that looks all right. But when you compare to what happens on the final beat of the canter, to so the picture on the top left, now that rider's body is in vertical and their seat bones are pointed down versus the one below it, which is what would happen if you start at vertical in beat one, then you're kind of forced to be leaning back behind the vertical on the third beat of the canter. And the problem with this position is, is that the seat bones point forward down and make a line of force that kind of sends the horse more onto the forehand, more onto the leading front leg. And you can actually compare it right away to the picture that's above it. And you can see that the pole is higher and that the contact on the reins is softer than it is on the picture where she's leaning back. So in order for you to be on the vertical in the most downhill beat of the canter, that means that your upper body has to be slightly inclined on beat one of the canter. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I don't think this is the greatest, um, it, yeah, I, I don't think this is the greatest pit, um, demonstration of the horse using its body that well in any of these photos, <laughs> quite frankly, but it does show the rider's, um, the rider's orientation. But Jane is talking about how you can really see that the horses um, bulge here at the third vertebrae much more in this picture than any of the others. But I would say in all of them, the horse is a little bit, um, had a tendency to not go with the pole up, but with the third vertebrae up. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think that is like the big in depth thing. And if everybody wants to take a look at, oh, I took a couple of, these are a couple of photos of rising trot mechanics. This first one, um, just as a quick little rising trot thing to ignore the beanbag bouncy ball thing. I'm not going to talk about that, but this is a picture of the sit phase of the rising trot. And you can see that her body is ever so slightly in front of the vertical. So we have a similar thing that needs to happen in rising trot like in canter. So in the sit phase of the rising trot, your body has to be slightly inclined, your torso, so that when you're in the up phase of the rising trot, you can be vertical. If you are vertical when you're in the sit phase of a rising trot, when you go to rise, your upper body will now be behind the vertical. So that's why, and this up picture is a really great example of, she has her maintained her alignment at the, at the top of the rise, and what's important about a, a correct rising trot mechanism is that she is able to maintain her vertical alignment and she's generated enough thrust to have her pubic bone clear the pommel of the saddle and invite the horse to make the best possible thrust with its trot that it could, which I don't know that this horse <laughs> particularly could make a much bigger trot than this. It looks like it's going to track really quite short, 
but it, it wouldn't be because of her her position. I, I think she's doing probably a really good job on a on a, a older average horse. Okay, and I think we've gone through all of these thumbnails. So let's, um, if everybody wants to go to the video, I wonder if I can click on it on on here. Will it, will it, will, will that work? Oh. Okay, so this is just a little video clips that I made with a student of mine. Um, the first one is the lateral alignment from behind in the trot. And there's a little bit of tape on her back. So you can see that the midline of her lines up pretty well with this horse who has a, a dorsal stripe on her back. <clears throat> Maybe there's a little tendency for her to drop her left shoulder down. You can kind of see that through the, the cross taping. But it's a general good impression of there being 50-50 on each side of the horse. So now we're going to look at some examples of what a C-curve might look like. So that's a C-curve to the left. And Kaylee doesn't see curve to the left all that great. I think I took the sound out, but I'm in here going, do it more, more crooked. <laughs> Alexis, could we uh, see if we can make it bigger? Just see if- Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> are, you, are, you guys, are you guys watching it on your screens? Because you can watch it on your screens. Um, we've been oh. able to watch it on yours, actually. Oh, okay, it's working, okay. But I did provide the link just in case. Okay, um, yeah. So we'll see, when, yeah. just so everyone knows, when Alexis and I were playing with this, it was very- I'm gonna pause it, okay. So I'll go back just a little bit here. So, okay, so now we'll look at the um, vertical alignment in the trot. And you're also gonna be looking for, do we think that um, she has a, a, a high level of tone of tensegrity and watching the mechanics of her elbow joint and her hip joint. <clears throat> so you can see the, the, the spine stays neutral, stays straight up and down. And you can see her thigh bone doing that little rotate. You know, it goes by quick. Let's go back to it. Let's look at it one more time. I think it's a really nice example. Actually, I, can, I think I can put it in slow motion. That'll be fun. Let's put it in half speed. Here we go. So there, I think it's really pretty clear that her spine doesn't distort, but the hip joint opens and closes. And there's a little wiggle in, 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 in the foot, but it's, it's not severe, right? Everybody's got a work in progress. All right, and so here's some common mistakes in the vertical alignment that you might see. It's a hollow back. We see this a lot, right? <laughs> I think this is a pretty common dressage thing. And you can see there's a, a bunch of air time between her butt and the saddle when she hollows the back because without her seat bones pointed straight down, it makes it much harder for her to use her hip joint. And then this is hollowing the back and leaning back, which I would say is the number one common fault that you see in, in the sitting trot in dressage riders. And, and if your eye has been developed to think that this looks elegant or correct, um, then hopefully you can look at what the horse is doing in response <laughs> and change your opinion of that. Okay, and then round back, you don't see this as often. It's harder, it was harder to demonstrate. I had to demonstrate it because, oh, I think Kaylee tried. Yeah, Kaylee tried, but she's not, she was, she is default a hollow back rider. So it's much harder for her to try to make a round back. I think I do it. Um, okay, so here's a, a hollow back with a chair seat, which is like thighs two horizontal legs in front of you. <clears throat> and I don't do hollow as well as Kaylee does. But pretty much anything that you do wrong on this horse makes her want to overflex. She's just everything that could go wrong. She, she says her default would be to just give too much to the contact. Okay. And then here's a round back. I can do round back better than Kaylee can. And this is, you know, seat bones forward, and it makes it much harder for me to use the joints of my elbow and stabilize the position of my hand.
Okay, and then here's some canter alignments. This is vertical alignment, so we're looking at it from the side. And you see that, wait, and there isn't any walk in this video, but you can get a sense of that the hip joint closes to the back and then opens to the front, and the elbow joint and the hip joint work together. And that Kaylee's body doesn't, her upper body doesn't come in a line that's behind the vertical. And this is the most common thing that you see in the canter is leaning back and, and over driving with the seat, right? So she gets to vertical on the first beat of the canter, but then she's quite a bit behind on the leading leg and, and, and unstable in her tone and tensegrity and therefore using her, her joints to shove the horse along, using her hip joint to shove the horse along. This is the opposite that you don't see as much maybe in dressage as you do in like the hunters, but it's out there. This is where she's not putting her weight on her seat bones, her weight's more in her foot and then hollow back. And I guess there's not a lateral alignment in canter. I'm not sure why that clip didn't make it in here. Um, but here is in motion what we're talking about with the vertical line. So this is a leg yelt. And you can see that my body stays over the middle of her body as she, as the horse travels to the left. <clears throat> and I'm gonna, um, maybe I'll put it back in real time here. There we go, okay. <clears throat> Cause it's kind of, otherwise it'll be a really long clip <laughs> in half time. Okay, and then the same is true in the half pass that you have to keep putting yourself over where the center of the horse is or is about to be in order to not be against the movement in the lateral movement. And this is what's gonna, this will show you what is more common. So that the rider is, is on the side of the horse that is moving away from. And it makes it really hard to keep the horse's alignment when we're not laterally aligned over them. And you're gonna see the same thing in half pass, which I think Honestly, I think you see it more in the half pass than you do in the leg yield. So it's the same thing. So I'm way over to the outside and trying to send the horse in the direction of the half pass is really difficult. <clears throat> All right. I hope that was helpful. I think it's a cool little clip. So I'm, I was happy to have made those. I think they've been really useful. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think that is kind of a long overview. Um, and yeah, does anybody have any questions or anything that I didn't make clear enough for terminology? Yeah. It feels really weird to be on this like one sided thing, but know that there's all these people. It's a funny, it's a funny sensation. <laughs> I, I can say something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Make you feel better. <laughs> um, uh, what is your experience with riders kind of changing over time? Like, for example, I was a very uh, hollow backed rider for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, coming from the hunter world um, and the equitation world uh, with not great trainers. And now I feel like my tendency is more round back. Mm -hmm. And then also, do you ever see a difference between a rider that may be hollow backed in the trot and round backed in the canter? So those are your questions. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I might have to have you like tell me about the, the end of that question again, because I will forget by the time we get to it. So, no <laughs> so changing over time, uh, it, it, it happens. And I think people who are type A and super diligent and determined, like most people in dressage are, have a tendency to go, oh my gosh, now that I know that I'm doing it wrong, I'm just gonna do it so right <laughs> and that they go the other way, right? That they overkill the other direction. And I think that's a normal path to go on. What's important is either having like eyes on the ground or mirrors or other tools that you can check in on yourself uh, to make sure that you haven't gotten too far the other direction. Uh, the Another way that you can Kind of give yourself peace of mind about about that potentiality is that whenever you do something new um mary actually mary has a great story about this that is like the smell in the room story 
So if you go into somebody's house and there's a really strong smell and right away you notice it and it's super, super strong. And then 10 minutes later, you don't notice it anymore. But if you go outside and you come back in again, you'll smell the smell all over. So when we first make a change to our position, it's going to feel huge and uncomfortable and abnormal. But if you are able to retain that change and you do it long enough, however long that might be for your particular perception and body, all of a sudden it doesn't feel strange anymore. And that triggers your brain to go, oh, I must not be doing it because it doesn't feel weird. So then you do it to the degree that it feels weird again. And now you've gone too far. So it's okay to like check in and go, this, this doesn't feel weird anymore. Am I still doing it? And you can use the you know, person on the ground. They don't even have to be an educated horse person. You can just say, am I doing X? Whatever that may be, especially when it comes to um, alignment, it's really easy to teach anyone how to view alignment, right? It, it, it's, it's a skill that you don't, you don't have to be a horse person to be able to go, does it look like I'm leaning to the left or the right? Am I making a C curve? is my ear behind my hip joint? Like those are questions that you can ask somebody that doesn't know anything about riding and they can give you an honest evaluation, like a very objective evaluation of whether that's happening or not. Okay, and then Megan, you said um, something about being hollow in trot and then yeah. round in um, I've noticed this, especially with my riders that have uh, a less than stable core where the canner, the motion of the canner will take a rider who I see as being a very hollow backed rider in the trot mm -hmm. and will kind of, especially in the downbeat, make them into a uh, round back <laughs> rider in that one moment. And yeah. you know, obviously there's the, you know, problem with the core strength. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, have you seen that? And other than core strength, is there something that, you know, a rider? Um, I would say that sometimes that? those people have just more flexibility, mobility than, um, than others. Right, like if you uh, low tone people and and people who are hypermobile tend to go together. Like it, it's it's harder for a um, a high tone person to make that kind of difference between the two, just because they have an, they are, are using their muscles all the time to to hold them in whatever position they want to hold their spine in or whatever part of their body in, and change comes more slowly. So. Uh, that's why I think it's really important to focus just as much on teaching somebody to increase their tensegrity and tone as it is to work on their correct alignment. Because if you get somebody, a, a low tone person aligned, you're just going to fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it until they have enough tone to support it. Um, because I, it, and I, that's something that I've just kind of learned along the, on the way um, that I don't know if it's something that Mary really talks about or focuses on is, it, it, in some ways, it might be better to teach somebody how to be really stable in whatever position that they're in and then try to fix their alignment. Like there might be some credence to that because if you can get somebody to be just firmer and more stable, then, um, then it makes it easier for them to learn how to be aligned. I haven't I've done that experiment, like starting from somebody new from scratch and going like, what would it be like if I just taught them to be really toned over time and then worked on the alignment? I'm not sure. But there could be something to that. So that would be my suggestion is, is that you work really hard on making them have that stability and then you can address like how they get malformed by the, the gates because maybe it will happen less and you don't even have to address the fact that they're getting hollow around. If, um, you know, yeah, if they yeah, understand sure. like the basics of the alignment and they can't hold on to it, it's probably more a tone issue than anything else. Yeah, I never thought about the, the relationship between rider tone and then rider alignment in mm -hmm. that, you know, if you, you can teach alignment all day long, but if they don't have the tone to hold the alignment, then they're not yeah. going to be able to. That's super interesting. Yeah. Um, in okay. the chat, Jan has a... Yeah, so it says centered riding talks about three points of balance, seat bones and pubic bones. I'm much more secure with Mary's seat than when I'm searching for that third point. I know people swear by center riding, but I'm having trouble trying to reconcile the two. I would agree with you, Janice. I haven't read, it's been a long time since I read Centered Riding. Um, and I think like just from a anatomy standpoint, there isn't a way for your pubic bone here, which actually isn't a bone, it's a piece of cartilage, to be on the saddle with your seat bones pointed down unless you have a saddle that is specifically shaped to allow you to do so. 
And in that case, you might be rather uncomfortable. I mean, like, I don't know about everybody else, but my pubic bone <laughs> is in a position in my body where the soft tissue between it <laughs> is not a place that I want to have pounding on the saddle supporting weight. So I think maybe what, if I'm going to, because I don't, I haven't read centered riding in a long time, but my interpretation is, is that it's more of a reference point than it is weight bearing. So the reference point should be, it should be centered between your seat bones. It should have an alignment to the front, not so much that it needs to bear weight. So that's kind of what I, I take from it. So I don't think you're wrong by having trouble reconciling it. I think Sally has a good message in, in some things, but she isn't as like science-based anatomy based as, as Mary's work is. Um, and then Sarah says, do your biomechanics change between different horses? I hope not. Uh, the only thing that really potentially could change is that it can be difficult to organize um, the, the angle of your thigh in the inward outward plane on different widths of horses. And some horses are going to be more inherently comfortable for somebody to ride than others because of the spread of their rib cage and how that allows you to put your thigh either um, thigh against them in, wh in which way, like if you have a really, really wide horse. Um, you're, it's going to be unavoidable that, that your hip joint now has to bend in or has to rotate in this plane as well as move in the front back plane. And for some people, this is excruciating and they can't ride um, a really wide horse because putting it here as well as having to mobilize this way is difficult. And so they don't follow the gates as well. Um, and then you could also have somewhat of the opposite problem. The horse is really narrow and it makes it difficult for you to make contact with their side and to make tone down your leg because there's nothing kind of filling it up. But it, besides the fact that horses gates have different volumes, it, it's not gonna affect how you should trying to be organized yourself. There are horses that are, have more power to them that require you to have greater tone and tensegrity to stay in balance, but your alignment is not gonna change. Okay. So now there's a lot, there's a lot of questions now. Okay, so is it possible that Sally Swift's understanding or misunderstanding what the pubic bone was where it, it could be, yeah, influenced her? <clears throat> um, so besides the tips that I gave about maintaining good tone, um, there, Mary teaches this really great exercise that I believe there is a YouTube video for um, that is called balloon breathing. And it will give you some insight on how to organize you, the tone of your bear down and breathe and make internal pressure. And I'm pretty sure if you just go on YouTube and like type in balloon breathing, it will come up as an exercise. If I had had balloons, I actually was thinking about like doing it so that you guys could see it. But basically it involves blowing up a balloon without pinching the balloon off with your fingers or your mouth between breaths. Does that make sense? So that means that you have to use the pressure of your insides to keep the balloon inflated while you inhale through your nose um, in anticipation of blowing into the balloon again. And um, yeah, any sort of um, like, like core strength kind of exercises, um, awareness exercises, uh, uh, like, um, what is it, Feldenkrais is really, great because it teaches you to move like slowly and smoothly, but you have to have a lot of tone to do these little movements. Um, a really simple one that people hate doing is, is doing planks <laughs> and feeling, um, feeling stiff and rigid is a normal part of the process if you are a low tone person starting out. So if you are starting out uh, as a low tone person the, and maybe a hyper flexible person too, making the right amount of support is going to feel rigid. So you can be okay with that and focus on that you make the following mechanics. And, and I think that will start to make you feel less rigid because um, you, do, you can't make clear following mechanics of the gates if you are really low tone, you just wobble around. And, and then it just, you know, you're, you're absorbing the motion, but it's like, um, like sitting on like a vibrating bed and you're just like letting it happen to you rather than you choosing how the horse's motion moves you. <clears throat> um, tips for teaching a rider who absorbs the canter in the waist, spine, hip joint, not actually a rider, work with falters. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, because those, those kids are probably um, 
all very flexible and mobile from doing the vaulting. So, so I would say teaching them what the mechanic of absorbing the canner with their hip joint is, and then the stability component, right? If they understand that the way that they need to move to the canner is by bending and unbending their hip joint, then it may automatically take away some of that, right? They're just doing what comes naturally to their flexible body. So if you say, okay, we're gonna use this bend, um, then, then that's how you do it. That's usually the way that I go about it in teaching riders um, is I both teach them to make more stability um, overall in their riding and then I, te and I teach them what the correct mechanic for following is. It's much easier to have somebody actively do something than it is to tell somebody don't, 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 right? Just with anything in life, right? Like we, we hate hearing the word don't or stop or no. That's really hard to undo. It's much easier to say, here are these things that you're going to actively do. Try to actively do these things, this short list of things. And then don't focus too much on telling them not to do those other things. It's like almost impossible to tell somebody to stop doing something with their body because a lot of times they're not even aware of it. But if you give them something that they can do with their body, then you've opened up a, a way to change them. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, vault, vaulters are vaulters are would be fun and interesting because they are like super brave and everything and <laughs> they just like get up there and just ah, whatever yeah I, I taught some vaulters a million years ago when um it, that when I was working at a riding summer camp and it was really hard to keep them like entertained because they felt like just like riding the horses like normal was really boring <laughs> they were like eh this is you know I could just stand up here it's way cooler than just like riding around <laughs> but I don't have that kind of bravery so it's not for me um anybody else we haven't hit the 24-hour mark yet but we d we've done good <laughs> great um yeah I think that um maybe to end is there um a way that you can give us like so as we're listening, you know, thinking like, am I a hollow back rider? Am I a round back rider? I've got a chair seat. Maybe some of your position fixes so that those of us who are still able to go out to the barn, knowing that we're a hollow back rider, maybe have something <laughs> to think about. Uh, um, while riding. Yeah, I, 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 you know, get to know your seat bones, get to know your seat bones, get to know your seat bones. <laughs> uh, it's like such my like big, big advice for everyone because they, you can get so much feedback on what the rest of your body might be doing based on whether you're, you can feel your seat bones and they are organized underneath the view, right? Um, it's, it's really difficult to be hollow or round with your seat bones pointed straight down. So you would do a huge service yourself or a huge amount of change just by spending enough time riding going, are they still pointed down? Are they still pointed down? Are they still pointed down? Once you evaluate um, that you can, you can get that. Yeah, and videoing yourself is a, a great tool. Um, I know not all of us have mirrors, so um, if you have somebody that can even take still pictures or um, you could get really crazy and you take your saddle and the saddle stand and you put it in front of your closet mirror <laughs> and you sit in it and you can look at yourself in the, in the horizontal view. And, and you can evaluate hollow and round, like sitting sitting there in your saddle in a stand without even being on your horse. So now everyone's gonna have a saddle in their bathroom. Um, so you can use that as a tool. I, I, I find that it's probably, there's not a whole lot of like visual feedback you can get just by looking at your own body when you're riding to evaluate like hollow round, but the seat bone position is such a huge clue to that. There are people who can um, do like a, a upper back hollowing or rounding and somehow manage to keep their seat bones pointed straight down, but it's much rarer and it's unlikely um, that, that that is happening. Um, and, if it, and if it is, you can go, I'm gonna get my seat bones down and, and you can use your hands on your body, like putting a hand on your chest and a hand in your low back can give you feedback about that. Like if you are hollowing just from up high, you'll be able to see that you're levering your hand up instead of it being um, more under your face. It would be like sticking out in front of you. Um, the other thing, and this is kind of 
crass, but I use this one a lot. <laughs> I, I tell people that you can check where your boobs are aiming. So if, you, if your boobs are aiming at the sky, you are probably hollow and your boobs should aim somewhere at the horse's neck. Um, if you have a video or a picture or something of yourself riding and you can go, okay, this is where on the horse's neck my boobs should aim, like on this picture of me on Gooey, you can see kind of my boobs aim like at the lower middle third of his neck. And I know that for how he carries himself most of the time, like that's kind of the right angle. You know, if your horse is not an upper level horse, their neck is going to be probably lower than this. And so your boobs would aim further up the neck, right? Does that make sense? Like their head would be lower. So um, your boobs would aim at something closer to the top third of the pole, perhaps. Um, and, and you could figure out, okay, where do they need to aim in order for me to be in neutral? But definitely if there, there's, there's no horse that has its head so high that your boobs need to aim at the sky. So if they're aiming up there, you're probably hollow backed. Um, and if they're aiming at your knees, then you're probably round backed. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's like, um, and what, the more you increase your body awareness just through like doing this and asking yourself these questions, then I think your own feedback of whether you're in the right place or not is going to improve. I, would you agree with that, Megan? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, like, I think my like my awareness of where my body is and where I, what I'm doing wrong is is pretty good at this point, and I don't need somebody to tell me most things. Like I'm usually noticing and correcting and noticing and correcting on on yeah. my own. Uh, you know, yeah, after definitely. Riding this way more versus yeah. riding in a horse focused way. Yeah, no, and that's what I've noticed. I mean, that's it goes back to what, what I think during my very first Mary clinic when she's talking well, about as, you, <laughs> as you're moving through the levels uh, that the the puzzle. It's essentially you're you're putting together a puzzle, and in the very beginning, you're just trying to figure out where the edge pieces are, and then as you kind of hone in on you know developing this puzzle, you know as you become an upper level rider, it's just a matter of putting one piece in one place. Come and on, so you're at, I'm gonna let my dog in. Oh yeah. <laughs> So that kind of reminds me of, of this is that as you become more and more developed on, on any plane as a rider, you're going to get more and more aware and it's just one more puzzle piece. That Absolutely. You kind of, yeah. Yeah. And so then you, you know, you Alexis and an upper level rider is going to be able to notice like, oh, that puzzle piece is oh, <laughs> here. Uh, um, but, you know, you'll notice if one puzzle piece is out of alignment versus being a lower level rider as you're still learning. Um, you're not going to notice if one puzzle piece is out of alignment because the whole thing's out of alignment. Exactly. And so as a lower level writer, that's why we're well saying like take lessons, get video, look at mirrors, you know, that kind of thing. And as you get more and more familiar with these concepts, then you'll notice, whoops, there I go again. I can feel that mm -hmm. back getting hollow and stuff like that. So that's what I've noticed doing the Mary stuff. And I've only done it for, you know, three years now. So, um, but definitely getting a little, little better at noticing things. Although I, yeah. I still feel like I learn brand new things about the way that I sit on a, on the back of a horse, you know, every time I ride or every. Well, that's great. I mean, I do too. It's a great, yeah. it, it's a great, it's a great feeling like, you know, to go like, wow, you know, I do, how long have I been doing that? <laughs> you know, I think the more, the more, more awareness you have, the more you get, like, I, I just, you start to notice like, different and new and smaller things like the more things that you have noticed in the past it yeah definitely seems to be my experience because yeah and, and every horse will bring out like different noticings if you have the ability to ride different horses then it will bring out you go oh like this really makes me want to do x or I you know want to get hollow on this horse versus not on this horse or mm -hmm. you know I need so much more tone to ride this one that I can't uh I, I can't generate it to stay aligned or whatever the case may be. So yeah, yeah. And so that goes to like patterning horses, patterning riders, riders, patterning horses. So mm -hmm. as you've moved through the levels of you, you know, not even just like from training through Grand Prix, but as you become a better rider, have you noticed that less horses have the ability to pattern you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And so what, like, so I, I know the type of horse that can pattern me, but what kind of horse do you feel like patterns you the most? Um, gosh, that's a, that's a good question. I think for a while, it probably would have been a horse who's like gooey, which is like would, um, it, he, he could water ski, 
um, motorboat you like no other and he's just super hot and very powerful and it's really easy to cram his neck together but then he can tow you along with like a hundred weight a hundred pounds in the reins and, mm -hmm. and and I could at one point because I'm actually pretty strong for a little compact person and and I could deal with that reasonably well and just like let it happen without looking like it was it was towing me and so that was kind of problematic for me in a in a lesson format because um people wouldn't see it and they just go oh, this is fine you know ride another half pass and I'm just like well okay <laughs> you're like should it feel this way though yeah is it supposed to be like this and so really? i think i kind of allowed that type i could allow that type of horse to pattern me because i'm like well everyone seems to think it looks great so it must be okay right mm -hmm. this must be how it's supposed to feel um and switching that script and just being like, nope, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to do it this way. And I'm not going to, you know, allow that or get sucked into it. And even sometimes it's like a day to day struggle where I'm like, oh, oh, this is starting to happen. I'm not going to get sucked into this because he can, um, he can still tow me along in the canter if, if he's really committed. <laughs> yeah, I believe you because I've felt that. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been a lot. It's been like a, amazing. Like the last three months have, or maybe like four months have been like a different horse. Actually, Kaylee, oh, wow. came, up, Kaylee came up and rode him and she's like, I don't know what you've done, but I didn't know that he could go like this. So it's like, neither did I. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how I felt the last time I rode him. And that was like over yeah. Thanksgiving, I think. And yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's, continuing to, it's continuing to improve. It's all the grass e eating while riding. That's what's <laughs> yeah. <in it. laughs> yes. Definitely. Um, yeah, like, well, like three or four months, Jane. I mean, even before Dr. Hauschman, I kind of started playing around and changing him and doing weird stuff to him, but um, even better. Uh, today, actually, we like did this really weird ride where I rode him just in the walk and in the like tiny trot for like 20 minutes and then just like pee offed. <laughs> for a long time and he was totally cool with it. I was like, if I never escalate things in the trot and I don't canter first, he will like kind of pee off like lazily and I can manipulate him and it's amazing. And then we like did some canter work and I was like, hmm, this is interesting. interesting. Yeah. So we'll see what, you know, if I can put that into some other part of a ride. I don't know yet. Yeah. 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 But I don't know. I could give a whole talk on 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 Gooey's life story because he's, <laughs> he's special. Yeah, he is. He's definitely one of the most cerebral rides I've ever yeah experienced. Yeah. Like he was he's not as like I think the first time I rode him he felt very physical, but that was like earlier in my Mary mm -hmm. career, and that was like before you'd done as much work as you have. But yeah, I still yeah. remember not being able to talk to you during while I was riding him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I like I had to walk and then be able to switch my attention off of him. <laughs> yeah. Because he's yeah, he's a you've done a great job with him. He's a very tricky, tricky horse. For those yeah. of you who don't know who he is, he's the chestnut in that picture right there. And he's very cool, but very tricky. Um so definitely benefited a lot from the rider biomechanics and everything. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, Mar I mean Mary's was the one who just like you know, I showed up to the lesson with her and it's like, well, you know, I'm here because nobody else seems to see what the issues are. And, and she just like tapped into it, like right from the very beginning. And, um, oh, wow. yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I could stick with this. This is different than, yeah. Than, than, yeah. I know. I feel like a lot of people that end up finding the Mary Wanla stuff have horses like that. Cause I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I, what I'd been doing was working on every horse, but mine. And so yeah. I get him and I'm like immediately thinking outside the box and, uh, Mary, like, you know, totally, I haven't ridden with her and she's still like through her words and the workshops mm -hmm. really changed the way that, that my horse goes. So yeah, yeah. really cool. Well, uh, and, it, and now it, like having done the work that I've done with Dr. Hashman and like going through his materials and stuff, it really aligns with what, he wants to have happen in the horse like because of the biomechanical development of the horse and like the classical principles and it it, it totally is mary's work too he just doesn't have the words to help the rider so much but the way that he wants the horse to go it comes from like the position of uh, that you can gain and the awareness that you can gain from from doing the bio rider biomechanics work 
Yeah, that's super interesting. I wish I'd been able to come up and watch that. But well, he's, he'll be out again, um, hopefully in May. Oh. Yeah, we'll see. What yeah. Happens. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're for, welcome. You know, doing this. And uh, um, yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, post them now because we're like right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should get people to suggest other topics or other people. I'm not oh, saying yeah. they necessarily need to do it here, but they could email you and, yeah. um, and, and then that way they can, you know, if someone, if somebody wants to give a talk or you guys have suggestions for other topics, that would be cool because oh, Megan yeah. and I can pool our resources of people or we may be able to give them ourselves. Um, yeah, definitely. If yeah. you guys, I mean, like you all have my email, so, you know, and you actually have Alexis's email. And yeah. so uh, send me topic suggestions, send Alexis topic to sessions. One other thing that I uh, was thinking of Alexis is that maybe we could do a more in-depth of uh, the canner mechanic because that's been something that I've had a lot of feedback on. Uh, okay. I really need to, you know, that a, a lot of, most of, Pretty much everyone who comes to me, you know, wanting lessons. Oh, you cut, you cut out uh, there for a second. Oops, most of what? Sorry. For the most part, every lesson I teach has to have some kind of canner mechanic in it, you know, uh -huh. for that. And so having some, you know, maybe going into some in-depth, you know, things. I've got a bunch of videos that I could send you. Um, okay. Yeah. Of me attempting yeah. to do poor canner mechanics. Peony has a <laughs> video of her previously, and I think Nicole has some too. So hmm. maybe we can chat um, and set something up you know, into okay. deep dive. Um, but yeah. yeah, and then your other ideas that you sent me are awesome too. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, and no, I really, I really want to um, pick apart horse bodies because I think uh, people don't look at their horses enough <laughs> as to yeah. what, it means, no, I'm, what it means about how they're developing and, and everything. Um, yeah. yeah, and now, and now, like, now that I look at them more like that, I just, like, I can't unsee it. So. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's going to come out of quarantine like <laughs> yeah right well you can it, it's position. funny like if you go like just looking at um where's that where's that onky picture again like this this picture so I mean there's like a, so many things wrong with this but um the this horse has totally what um this gal Paula that I have like made friends with on the internet who lives on the east coast who used to be a judge and she is like has an amazing eye and I think at one point was a really formidable teacher. Um, this horse has the, what she would call the tube neck, the pipe neck. So you see the oh. line um, that kind of goes from the corner piece of the bridle there and then down the middle of the neck. And it doesn't go all the way down the base of the neck, but you can, it, maybe it's in shadow. So that bulging severely like it does at the top is, um, is like a hundred percent an indicator of the horse having been ridden like front to back and being closed by the hand. Interesting. Always. And and like roll curry. And in this in the picture of Gooey, this is an old photo. So this is maybe like 2013 or something. And you can see mm -hmm. he has some of that remnant in there. Yeah. And if you saw him today, um, you would see much less of this. Less of interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, that would be super cool to be able to kind of yeah, you know, know what but we're looking that, for. Yeah, it's just interesting the definite the difference in the definition there, and yeah. again, and you can see it the um you know in in young horses too. But yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of things wrong with the horse's body in this picture of Salinero, but um that that one is kind of it's really evident there. That and the you know the broken trot rhythm and blah 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that but unfortunately, unfortunately, we somehow have been conditioned to think that this is what an extended trot looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What does it say? How certain can we be? X type of riding creates Y symptom. Or, um, it's <laughs> kind of further kind of discussion for another day, but um, it's from what from what I have gathered from some of the like research that I've been doing on it and also just what I'm seeing resultantly in my own horses or in other horses that I see that are being ridden certain ways I I, I think it um it it is kind of that they're they don't build themselves this way without being ridden improperly or vice versa they won't build themselves the other way without being ridden properly um uh, that being said, there are horses who carry themselves in a certain way in nature that they can have the underlying shape like primed for incorrect development more than others. So an example of that would be like a Frisian, right? 
they would choose to carry themselves in a, in a compressed or contracted way by nature. So they've already got like the, the blueprint for building the muscles wrong. <laughs> But it won't be as like pronounced probably as it is like an onky source. Right. Yeah, and there'll, there'll be other yeah. like uh, mine is half region. And he definitely has like I'll look at him in the mirror and I'm like I there is no contact. Why are you holding yourself this way? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, this. yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Working against that may be another really interesting topic that we can discuss is where you mm -hmm. know the the off breeds working against you know having a horse that's not purpose bred. How you know how can we develop? correct muscling or go against mm -hmm. kind of what their, their tendencies are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that would be, would be a super interesting topic as well. Um, Cause yeah, my, mine, I'm looking at this bulbous bit and I'm like, my horse has never been encouraged to do this, but he does, you know, he, he does it on the lunch line. And mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, yeah. And they, yeah. There's plenty of horses that um, can run around in the pasture with their chin on their chest. I, the yeah. uh, issue is more so of that it's fine for them to do that. Like they can do whatever they want in nature. Like it, mm -hmm. it's fine. They can do that because they're not being impeded by the weight and leverage of the rider. So it's okay. You know, like if they choose to move that way, like they can move that way and, and that's all right. The, what's not okay is, is us, you know, putting them there or encouraging that because when we're on their back, because we are already impacting them negatively enough just by being on their body. So we have to develop the kind of muscles that support um, the negative impact or mitigate mm -hmm. the negative damage of being ridden in the first place. Yeah. <clears throat> but, all right. Cool. Well, well, yeah, let's discuss and we'll hopefully set up more of these. Okay. Um, that is my, my hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. I don't, is there a way, Megan, that we can look at like how many people were on and stuff? You have that? Um, I think that we had 38 at the, oh, cool. either 38 to 40. Um, oh, cool. at most, which yeah. was, I mean, my email went out to like maybe 80 people, 70, wow, that's 80. Good so we had about 50%. And I had a lot of people say like, oh, I have to be at the barn right now. I've got, mm -hmm. you know, something going on. So I, I am, this is being recorded. Um, and so I'm going to try to like send it out to, mm -hmm. to the people who, you know, haven't, um, you know, haven't been able to join, but, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking I've got some requests for weekend days instead. So we can kind of, we can play with the timing okay. uh, as well. I'll, I'll send out maybe a poll um, to everyone to find out when the best times are um, okay. and everything. So yeah, that's great. good. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm sure Thanks, we will guys. have this again with you. So. All righty. All right, have a good night, everybody. I gotta figure out how to get off of here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how do I? How do I get off? How do I? How do I not do it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you stop sharing your screen, and I can take back, back the hosting. Um, oh, okay. As well. Oh, okay. Host, and then that way I can. There we go. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do uh, so this is my, my life forever right? i'm here I know, forever no, I know. well that's fine just figure out how to point the uh the camera into the stalls with the baby yeah at the mirror yeah <laughs> and we'll all stay on forever. oh here we go there's something that says leave meeting okay yes leave meeting good <laughs> all right bye, i've babe. got a i've got a button to end meeting so maybe okay. i'll do that okay okay well, bye see you later bye bye everyone thanks for coming